My name is Joseph Thebus, and I will be talking today about dramatic ritual and dramatic technique in ritual magic. My own work with dramatic ritual began around the age of 16, when I joined the initiatory Freemasonic order of de Molay. At that time, I was also a thespian, and I found it to be very interesting the way that drama and ritual intertwined and the similarities between the practice of each. At the time, I was unaware of the history of drama in Western culture, but as it turns out, drama and ritual have been literally intertwined since the beginning of both practices. The word for drama in Greek comes from the word tragos, and it meant originally a goat song. In Plato's Republic, he saw two kinds of dramatic invocation or tragedy. He referred to these as being once removed and twice removed from the ideal. The once removed was to him those dramas which celebrated the life of the gods. The twice removed were those dramas and farces which portrayed the lives of individual human beings. In Thelema, of course, we have reunited these two forms of dramatic ritual, and we find in Thelemic dramatic ritual that the individual is celebrated as divine. To illustrate the fact that drama and ritual are closely related, I want to read for you a couple of quotes from modern dramatists. The first one is from Antonin Artaud, from his book The Theater and Its Double. Only poetically, and by seizing upon what is communicative and magnetic in the principles of all the arts, can we, by shapes, sounds, music, and volumes, evoke states of an acuteness so intense and so absolute that we sense beyond the tremors of all music and form the underlying menace of a chaos as decisive as it is dangerous. And this essential drama, we come to realize, exists, and in the image of something subtler than creation itself, something which must be represented as the result of one will alone, and without conflict. And here's another from Grotowski's Statement of Principles. There's another modern dramatist. He writes, Theater, through the actor's technique, his art in which the living organism strives for higher motives, provides an opportunity for what could be called integration, the discarding of masks, the revealing of the real substance, a totality of physical and mental reactions. This opportunity must be treated in a disciplined manner, with a full awareness of the responsibilities it involves. Here we can see the theater's therapeutic function for people in our present-day civilization. It is true that the actor accomplishes this act, but he can only do so through an encounter with the spectator, intimately, visibly, not hiding behind a cameraman, wardrobe mistress, stage designer, or makeup girl, in direct confrontation with him, and somehow instead of him. The actor's act discarding half-measures, revealing, opening up, emerging from himself, as opposed to closing up, is an invitation to the spectator. This act could be compared to an act of the most deeply rooted, genuine love between two human beings. This is just a comparison, since we can only refer to this emergence from oneself through analogy. This act, paradoxical and borderline, we call a total act. In our opinion, it epitomizes the actor's deepest calling. And I'm sure any ritualist who hears these two great dramatists of the 20th century can see how these ideas relate to those of magic. Now, the question I often hear is, what is the difference between dramatic ritual and other forms of ritual? And Aleister Crowley talks about this in a fair amount of depth in his Magic and Theory and Practice, or Part 3 of Liber ABA. 
I'll read a little bit from that. First, from his the first chapter of that book called The Principles of Ritual. He describes three methods of invo invocation, and uh, the first one being uh, that of devotion to a deity uh, through practices such as Liber Astarte. The second is straightforward ceremonial invocation. We see examples of that in the Goetia. The third method he identifies is the dramatic, and here's what he writes about it. Perhaps the most attractive of all. Certainly it is so to the artist's temperament, for it appeals to his imagination through his aesthetic sense. Its disadvantage lies principally in the difficulty of its performance by a single person, but it has the sanction of the highest antiquity, and is probably the most useful basis for the foundation of a religion. It is the method of Catholic Christianity, and consists in the dramatization of the legend of the god. The Bacchae of Euripides is a magnificent example of, which, of such a ritual. So also, though in a much less degree, is the Mass, the Gnostic Mass. We may also mention many of the degrees of Freemasonry, particularly the third, the five equals six ritual, is another example. He continues, in the case of Bacchus, one commemorates firstly the birth of a mortal mother who has yielded her treasure house to the father of all, of the jealousy and rage excited by this incarnation, and of the heavenly protection afforded to the infant. Next should be commemorated the journeying westward upon an ass. Now comes the great scene of the drama. The gentle, exquisite youth, with his following, chiefly composed of women, seems to threaten the established order of things and that established order takes steps to put an end to the upstart. We find Dionysus confronting the angry king, not with defiance, but with meekness, and yet with subtle confidence, an underlying laughter. His forehead is wreathed with vine tendrils. He is an effeminate figure with those broad leaves clustered upon his brow, but those leaves hide horns. King Pentheus, representative of respectability, is destroyed by his pride. He goes out into the mountains to attack the women who have followed Bacchus, the youth whom he has mocked, scourged, and put in chains, yet who has only smiled, and by those women, in their divine madness, he, Pentheus, is torn to pieces. A little bit later in this chapter, Crowley continues uh, talking about this method, the dramatic method of invocation. The magician who wishes to invoke Bacchus by this method must therefore arrange a ceremony in which he takes the part of Bacchus, undergoes all his trials, and emerges triumphant from beyond death. He must, however, be warned against mistaking the symbolism. In this case, for example, the doctrine of individual immortality has been dragged in to the destruction of truth. It is not that utter utterly worthless part of man, his individual consciousness as John Smith, which defies death, that consciousness which dies and re is reborn in every thought. That which persists, if anything persists, is his real John Smithiness, a quality of which he was probably never conscious in his life. And a little bit further, he, uh, he says, in the third method, that is the dramatic method, identity is attained by sympathy. It is very difficult for the ordinary man to lose himself completely in the subject of a play or of a novel, but for those who can do so, this method is unquestionably the best. Now, Aleister Crowley has another chapter in this book, which is devoted to dramatic rituals, and it's a very short chapter. I'm just going to go ahead and read it for you. It's chapter 19. The wheel turns to those effectual methods of invocation employed in the ancient mysteries and by certain secret bodies of initiates today. The object of them is almost invariably the invocation of a god, and that god is conceived in a more or less material and personal fashion. These rituals are therefore well suited for such persons as are capable of understanding the spirit of magic as opposed to the letter. One of the great advantages of them is that a large number of persons may take part, so that there is consequently more force available, but it is important that they should all be in harmony. 
it is well therefore that they should all be initiates of the same mysteries bound by the same oaths and filled with the same aspirations but they should not be friends unless by accident they should be associated only for this one purpose such a company being prepared the story of the god should be dramatized by a well-skilled poet accustomed to this form of composition lengthy speeches and invocations should be avoided but action should be very full such ceremonies should be carefully rehearsed but in rehearsals care should be taken to omit the climax which should be studied by the principal character in private the play should be so arranged that this climax depends on him alone by this means one prevents the ceremony from becoming mechanical or hackneyed and the element of surprise assists the lesser characters to get out of themselves at the supreme moment following the climax there should always be an unrehearsed ceremony an impromptu the most satisfactory form of this is the dance in such ceremonies appropriate libations may be freely used the rite of luna is a good example of this use here the climax is the music of the goddess the assistants remaining in silent ecstasy in the rite of jupiter the impromptu is the dance in that of saturn long periods of silence it will be noticed that in these rites poetry and music were largely employed mostly already published pieces by well-known authors and composers it would be better to write and compose specially for the ceremony so as we can see from alistair crowley's writing dramatic ritual is a major part of what many thelemites undertake through either the gnostic mass or the rites of initiation which crowley also said was a series of rituals invoking the god that is the candidate that being the case that dramatic rituals are such a major part of our work as thelemites and as members of either the ordo templi orientis or any other initiatory order it is to our benefit to consider dramatic techniques and how these may be applied to our ritual crowley mentions rehearsal and rehearsal is very important of course especially when you're working with multiple people it becomes necessary to work out where you're all going to be at any given moment how you're going to move and and interact with each other because everyone is depending on everyone else to do their part it is very useful to run through this on many occasions so that people so that the people involved can depend on each other and as crowley recommends omitting the climax i've also found it useful to omit any particularly powerful words for example in the gnostic mass when i rehearse instead of saying the name eao i will replace it with the phrase you know who this reserves the use of the great name for the ritual itself and thereby imbues it with a greater awe and mystery this is very much why we have secrets in esoteric orders such as ordo templi orientis just as a tangent i'll mention that the word secret has its etymology uh, in common with the word secrete and both words refer to the act of separating something out for special use and so this is why one of the reasons why we have secret rituals and why we have secret words so that they have been reserved for special use and are not used in a cavalier fashion or used in rehearsal and that way they don't become as crowley described it hackneyed or mechanical so omitting the climax omitting any particularly powerful words in re in rehearsal i've found to be useful um, these are magical techniques and uh, and i want to talk a little bit more about dramatic technique as it is applied to magic as many magicians have familiarity with these ideas of magical technique but uh, don't always have a background in drama and uh, therefore they may be unfamiliar with those techniques and why they're useful so we'll talk a little bit about those and the reason i think it's important to to apply the techniques of the dramatist to dramatic ritual is well 
it's obvious, first of all, if you're doing dramatic ritual, that half of that equation is drama. And as Crowley describes, that the effectiveness of dramatic ritual is dependent upon its ability to evoke sympathy in both the participants as well as any who are observing the ritual. And dramatic ritual really takes the most difficult aspects from both worlds of drama and ritual. They have some examples of the most difficult aspects of drama that we find in dramatic ritual include the fact that we're often working in close settings. Those who are observing or attending the ritual uh, with dramatic ritual, a lot of times the audience, so to speak, or the attendees are in some way participatory and there will be uh, very close settings. The people who are attending are very close to those who are performing the ritual. In fact, sometimes they may be in among those who are performing the ritual. And this can make it very difficult because you have their attention so close to you. You don't have the benefit of stage makeup and lighting separating you off so that if you have a drop of sweat or your eye twitches, people might not notice if you're on a stage, but if you're two feet away from them, five feet away from them, they may be easily able to see if you let your roll drop. Also, another aspect of working in dramatic ritual that is is uh, difficult is um, that there's only one wall, so to speak. In the dramatic arts, you will often hear people talk about breaking down the fourth wall or breaking the fourth wall. In a traditional proscenium stage, you have the stage itself, and then you have uh, three walls, one on either side and one behind the performers. And oftentimes there's a almost in, like an invisible fourth wall between the performers on the stage and the audience. And that distance that is created by the proscenium arch, as well as the elevation of the stage, is something that actors try to get beyond. They try to reach past that sense of a an invisible fourth wall so that they can draw the audience into the action. In dramatic ritual, we don't have the problem of the fourth wall. We have kind of an opposite problem where we have only one wall. We may not even have that. Um, in, for example, the Gnostic Mass, there's attendees on either side of the center of the ritual space and there's no you are fully immersed in among the attendees and there's no opportunity to turn away and take a breath so in that sense you are constantly required to be fully in your role in the in the ritual another difficulty of dramatic ritual is that there are very few people who are actually attending. You may have in a very large ceremony you might have 50 uh, or in a in a special annual or biennial major celebration where people come from around the country you might have as many as 200. But of course this is while in in magical circles the number of 200 people arriving for ritual is thought of as being a very large number in drama it would be a very small number uh, theaters often seat well over a thousand people and why would this make it more difficult uh, a lot of times people who don't have a lot of experience with acting might feel that it would be more difficult to work with a lot of uh, people observing the ritual because you have maybe greater stage fright or nervousness come into play. Well, that may be true at first. Uh, over time, the opposite becomes the case where you have a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of safety. When you have such a large number of people, you don't necessarily see any one of them as an individual who's scrutinizing your work. And it becomes more of a, just a sea of people who are faceless, especially if you have theatrical lighting, you, you, you may not even be able to see them. When you have only five or 10 or even 20 people who are observing the ritual, unavoidably, you become aware of the fact of each and every one of them. It becomes important to 
not only be aware of each and every one of them, but to actually engage each and every one of those people. And this can put a lot more pressure and challenge on the ritualist. Also, in many cases uh, with dramatic ritual, you have attendees who are active participants in the ritual. And they arrive on the evening of the ritual, oftentimes unprepared for what is about to take place, especially if it's something, it's maybe it's a ritual that somebody just wrote for, specifically for the occasion. Maybe a lot of people who are attending have no idea what to expect, and they are just arriving to learn their part in the ritual. This presents a whole new layer of difficulty in that you have to have a little miniature rehearsal with the attendees beforehand, maybe even preparing sheets of paper with their words on them. And we see this in the Gnostic Mass when a newcomer arrives and we have missiles for them to use so that they can follow along. So there's a few of the most difficult aspects of drama that we see in dramatic ritual. But dramatic ritual also incorporates many of the most difficult aspects of ritual. And as Crowley talked about a couple of these, one is that you're working with multiple people. A lot of times with ritual, you find rituals that are solo rituals where you're working just with yourself and you don't have you don't have to depend on anyone else to show up to bring the particular magical implements or to be in a particular place at a particular time in the course of the ritual you don't you're not depending on others to remember their verses that they're supposed to be reciting and so forth and in ritual if you're not working alone you may only be working with one other person perhaps as uh an oper operator and a scryer, or as two practitioners of sex magic. But it's oftentimes uh, not done to have many or multiple participants in a ritual unless it is a dramatic ritual. And of course, every person you add to a working, you are increasing the complexity of the ritual by an order of magnitude. And depending on the number of people involved, you may need to have separate rehearsals for different groupings of people. Uh, when I uh, directed the ship, for example, we had on many occasions we would have rehearsal happening in two different rooms. We'd have the probationers rehearsing their parts in one room and the principal actors in another room rehearsing other parts of the play. So working with multiple people is a particularly difficult aspect of ritual that you don't see much outside of dramatic ritual. Another difficulty of dramatic ritual that is not as present in other forms of ritual is that when you do the invocation in dramatic ritual, the whole point is to evoke that sympathetic response in others so that the invocation is active in every single person present. And that's something that is not a challenge of most other forms of ritual. Typically, you only have to cause yourself to be so inspired. But when you have to also inspire others, it adds a, another layer of difficulty. And finally, the fact of the matter is, as I mentioned, the, uh, the skills of the dramatist are very important in dramatic ritual for all the reasons of overcoming the difficulties that I've been describing. And Aleister Crowley talked about this as well when he wrote to Jane Wolfe about the Gnostic Mass. He said, As you know, not everyone can wear a robe. In the photographs of the Mass sent years ago, it was only too evident that Smith was not one of such. He has no presence, no personal dignity. But I had hoped that your experience of stage and screen would have somehow put this right. In any case, there was nothing else I could do, so I had to keep quiet when people wrote about 
amateur theatricals. This daw in Peacock's plumage impression is the very worst that anyone can give. I was absolutely amazed that you should have allowed anything of the sort to pass. I was relying on your experience of stage and screen to produce the mask properly, and why you did not do so is still a complete mystery to me. I have written to you before about this. I have told you that the mask must be up to Hollywood standards as to their production. It is no wonder that it failed to attract people. Whoever you have for priest, he must do at least 60% as well as the average film star. The same applies to the priestess. The others are not so difficult, as long as they do not actually jar the principles. So Crowley obviously placed a heavy importance on dramatic skill in the ritualists in the Gnostic Mass. And the Gnostic Mass is perhaps less dramatic in form than many other dramatic rituals, as he wrote uh, in his chapter on, on the principles of ritual. So, what are some of the skills and practices that one should undertake in order to effectively have good dramatic technique in place in ritual? First of all, preparation and rehearsals are key. I find that a fair rule of thumb is to have 10 hours of preparation and rehearsal for every one hour of ritual. That is, after you have it memorized and all the equipment together. Memorizing the ritual and getting all the equipment together could take hundreds of hours, depending on the complexity of it. But once you have all of that, once you have the ritual memorized and you have all of the gear that you need, all of the clothing, all of the magical implements and so forth, then spend about 10 hours rehearsing and preparing for every one hour of ritual. And this goes even if you've got it to the point where you can do the ritual in your sleep. For example, uh, you know, I myself have done uh, close to 150 performances of the Gnostic Mass as priest, and I can do it very easily at the drop of a hat. However, I'm not the only person in the ritual. And even if I were working with a group of people who all had the ritual memorized and had done it many dozens of times, it still may be the first time that the particular grouping of us has worked together on the ritual. And so it's important for all of these people, whether they, whether we're working together on the rehearsals or whether we've worked apart on individual rehearsals or practices, it's important for us all to have be, to be very well rehearsed. In the case of rituals that are worked less often, such as initiatory rituals or seasonal celebrations. If the ritual has never been worked before, then it becomes even more important to have this larger number of hours of rehearsal. When uh, when I work on an initiatory ritual, oftentimes uh, the people who I'm working with have less experience than I do. Some of them may be working the ritual for the first time. And so for a roughly one hour initiation, I will have four rehearsals of two hours each. And on top of that, I will recommend in between each rehearsal that the that those involved rehearse on their own at home. So preparation and rehearsals uh, is the first practice that I would recommend. Another one is to do warm-up exercises. Uh, basically, it just helps you to get into the mood of what you're doing. And warm-up exercises can and should be done before rehearsals as well as before the actual ritual performance. Warming up gets you limbered up for the work. It's just like warming up or stretching before going for a run or doing physical exertion. If you start your exertion while you're still stiff and waking up, it's going to be much more difficult and it's going to take some time for you to get into the groove. It's the same with dramatic ritual and with drama in general. If you start out your rehearsal of the ritual having just gotten off of work or having just woken up or otherwise having to transition from one frame of consciousness into the kind of thinking uh, that goes on in rehearsal, you'll be spending the first half of your rehearsal making that transition. So the warm-up helps you to kind of get into the groove of things before you start actually doing the work of rehearsing or actually doing the performance itself. So a few good ways to to warm up. Um, the first one is is one I commonly use, which is just a, a walkthrough, where it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a rehearsal, but it's not a rehearsal. It's just kind of... Uh, 
I don't want to say reading through because you you don't by this point you already have the thing memorized, but you're just uh, saying the lines and walking around to the places where you're supposed to be. It's not really a rehearsal so much as a warm up, and uh, this is something that I do before every performance of the Gnostic Mass, for example. And for one of these warm up walkthroughs, you have everyone participate. You try to keep questions and co side comments uh, for uh, until the end, and you can use it for stretching. And when I say stretching, I mean both physically, you know, stretching the body as well as the face and the mouth, as well as stretching the emotions and stretching your thinking. You can, while you're doing your warm up walkthrough, you can emphasize things or overemphasize things or be more dramatic than you normally would be, even employing melodrama to kind of stretch beyond your normal level of intensity. It's also a good time to overemphasize your diction and your enunciation of words. And that way, when you go into the ritual, you've been pushing yourself beyond where you normally would go, it becomes more easy to enunciate in a natural way. So by physically stretching, I mean literally stretching muscles like you would, uh, you can stretch, do, do yoga stretches, or you can um, stretch your face out by making exaggerated facial expressions. You can scrunch up your face, widen your eyes and open your mouth, stretch out your jaw, stretch out your eye muscles, get everything limbered up. You can also use the warm-up period as a time, especially right before doing the actual ritual, as a time for doing meditative work and lustrating and consecrating the implements you'll be using in the ritual. The more of this kind of preparation you do, the more intense you will be able to be focused. It's also good during the warm-up period to have some uh, quiet sitting time, simple meditation where you're thinking and acting as little as possible so that you can have a more highly concentrated state of consciousness for the actual performance. In the early stages of rehearsal and preparation, you can also use drilling as a warm-up technique. Before rehearsing, you're at a stage where your memorization is not quite gelled. You can sit aside with a partner during your warm-up period and drill through the lines. You just take a difficult section of text and repeat it over and over again for good memorization as well as for even... Uh, meditative effect as if it's a mantra. And as a final note on memorization, I've mentioned a few different times that it's important to have stuff memorized, or I've taken that for granted. And of course, it is true that with dramatic ritual, as in any form of ritual, the more of the text you have committed to memory, uh, assuming you are doing something that is scripted and not improvisational, it's going to be easier for you to evoke the states of consciousness necessary for the ritual if you have it committed to memory. You won't be busy trying to find what page you're on or trying to evoke while you're reading off the page. So that is some brief advice on dramatic technique in ritual. And I hope uh, that you find it useful and interesting. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. You can find my email address on the podcast blog at speechinthesilence.com. Also on the blog, you'll find a few links to some of the documents I quoted in this talk, as well as other resources. Thank you for listening.